Hey everyone, I'm Ben Norton, and today I'm joined by a really good friend of mine, a Venezuelan journalist from the very important website Orinoco Tribune. His name is Jesus Rodriguez Espinosa. He's the editor of Orinoco Tribune. You can find that at orinocotribune.com. He's based in Caracas, and today we're going to be talking about the latest situation in the country under brutal U.S. sanctions. And the latest news you might have seen is that the so-called interim president, in scare quotes, is no longer so-called interim president. I'm talking about Juan Guaido. This is a man who never participated in a presidential election. He never won a single vote from a Venezuelan to actually be so-called interim president. Yet the United States recognized him as that from the beginning of 2019 right until the end of 2022. Maduro is an illegitimate ruler, a tyrant who brutalizes his people. But Maduro's grip on tyranny will be smashed and broken. Here this evening is a very brave man who carries with him the hopes, dreams, and aspirations of all Venezuelans. Joining us in the gallery is the true and legitimate president of Venezuela, Juan Guaido. Mr. President, please take this message back to your family. And what happened? The parallel opposition-controlled so-called National Assembly, which also is not constitutional, voted to remove him. This means that after more than three years of a U.S. coup attempt, Guaido is done. This is the end of Guaido. And at the same time, the U.S. government has refused to recognize the actual elected constitutional president of Venezuela, Nicolás Maduro. Instead, the State Department said that it only recognizes the so-called National Assembly, which is a parallel National Assembly created by the right-wing opposition, controlled by the right-wing opposition, as opposed to the real National Assembly. The U.S. government said it only recognizes that body as the supposed only democratic institution in Venezuela. So while the majority of the world recognizes the real constitutional government of Venezuela, including the European Union, they, they observe the 2021 regional elections and the European Union stopped recognizing Juan Guaido, and yet the U.S. still refuses to recognize Maduro, while at the same time trying to get Venezuela to sell it oil, to drop the price of oil on the international market. So it's, it's a complete disaster in terms of U.S. foreign policy. But in the meantime, the Venezuelan economy is growing. The inflation rates in Venezuela have dropped significantly compared to the hyperinflation it was suffering with years ago. And the sanctions do continue. But as we'll talk about today, the country is moving forward and advancing and, and has new economic alternatives. So Jesus, let's begin talking about this latest media circus where uh, the so-called uh, National Assembly in Venezuela, which is actually a parallel National Assembly, voted to drop recognition of Guaido. Clearly, it would not make this kind of decision without approval from the United States. I mean, they don't go outside without getting approval from Uncle Sam. It, you know, they they obediently follow orders. So. Can you explain why you think they decided that Guaido's usefulness no longer, that he outlived his usefulness and why they decided to drop him? And what is this so-called National Assembly that the U.S. is referring to as the only institution it recognizes in Venezuela? Yes, yeah, thank you. Thank you, Ben, for inviting me uh, to talk to you. Uh, it's always a pleasure to do that. And, uh, and what you say is right. I mean... Uh, I mean, first of all, one has to analyze the, the this recent incident around Juan Guaido, uh, taking into consideration that our opposition, at least that opposition that is uh, in that fake National Assembly, uh, do not, I mean, they don't do anything uh, without asking permission uh, to the White House. So we have to understand that this, like, uh, like uh, in reality, like, uh, like a move uh, by Washington in order to try to shake a little bit uh, the, 
regime change operation against President Maduro. Uh, and, and secondly, and going to the, the, the real, you know, the, the details about what happened is that basically uh, the three parties of what we call the G4, G4 is like a group of, the group of parties that uh, allied with Washington in order to make this regime change operation happen. I mean, I'm talking about Acción Democrática, I'm talking about uh, Un Nuevo Tiempo, I'm talking about uh, Primero Justicia, and I'm talking about Voluntad Popular. These are opposition Extreme political parties. Far right opposition party. Exactly, yes. And, and those three that I just mentioned, uh, uh, Liva uh, Voluntad Popular, that is a party that, uh, to which belo uh, Guaido belongs, and, uh, and they decided, they voted for this uh, new uh, um, fake institutionality uh, where Juan Guaido is no longer the visible head of the, of the, of the, of the government. And, uh, and they uh, appointed a, like a committee or a small board with three women that no one knows that don't have any political real relevance in Venezuelan politics. Uh, and that leaves a road, uh, and they appoint them like the successors of uh, of uh, Juan Guaido. So the, 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 it's important to highlight that what happened doesn't mean that the the fake interim government. I mean, the, the fake interim government disappears, but the whole the structure uh, is just like adjusting to. Uh, in my opinion, to uh, possible disintegration, but they don't want to do it fast. They are going to do it by steps. So that's why they created this board of administration. Basically, is to administer the money that the gringos gave them. Out of the money that the gringos are rough from Venezuela, I mean, money and assets like Citco, for example, and, and frozen accounts and things like that. So, so that's why they kept this new... Uh, administration board that is going to be in charge allegedly in charge of of administering the money uh that the, our opposition received from the u.s which by the way is plagued with uh, a lot of corruption complaints and denunciations uh not coming from the uh, chavismo i mean those complaints but coming from the same uh the i mean the the, the same opposition people you know so this is what is happening uh, uh, in Venezuela. Um, many people talk about uh, this being a coup d'etat against Juan Guaido. I mean, a coup d'etat by these three parties uh, against Voluntad Popular and Juan Guaido. I really don't see it like that. I believe that, uh, I mean, Leopoldo Lopez, which is the real head of Voluntad Popular, is okay with this change. Uh, you know, after following what he writes in his Twitter account and things like that, I, he, he basically did not complain too much about the decision of removing Juan Guaido. So, so that's what takes me to the, the, the first thing that I mentioned you, that the, our opposition do not do any, they don't do anything uh, uh, without direct orders from Washington. So this is a Washington move, if you ask me. Yeah, and Jesus, you mentioned something very important, which I was going to ask you about, which is that the United States and the European Union have seized $40 billion of Venezuelan assets, essentially stolen that money. In the case of the Bank of England, it stole more than $1 billion worth of gold that, that belong to, belongs to the Venezuelan people. That's gold that's part of the foreign exchange reserves of the Venezuelan Central Bank. The United States has also stolen huge numbers of assets. You mentioned Citgo, which is an oil refinery company that had been based in the United States and was stolen and is also worth several billion dollars with a B. So now Guaido, this you know coup leader who never controlled anything inside Venezuela, the only, the only assets he controlled were things that the U.S. and the E.U. stole for him outside of Venezuela. Now he is gone, but the U.S. still recognizes this parallel right-wing controlled opposition parliament 
only because they have control over the, these forty billion dollars in assets, and clearly, the U.S. and to a less, and not not even really the the EU, but more Britain, are trying to figure out what to do because the EU stopped recognizing Guaido in two thousand twenty one, but Britain and the U.S. continued recognizing Guaido until his end in December two thousand twenty two, and a big part of that is because Britain, of course, has still is the the british legal system is still trying to steal this 1 billion dollars of gold that belongs to venezuela so what i mean of course you can't predict the future but what do you see potentially as a scenario for what will happen with those 40 billion dollars of assets you talked about the allegations of corruption rampant corruption that are allegations made by the right wing opposition itself against other members of the right wing opposition are they just going to just destroy those forty billion dollars in assets by, you know, pushing it into their own bank accounts or decreasing its value and stripping it of all value? I mean, it's it's hard to see what will happen. Do you really think it'll go back to the Venezuelan people? I hope that that happen. Uh, uh, now that you raise the issue of the resources, the financial resources seized by 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 the gringos. Uh, uh, I remember that uh, something that has been talked in Venezuela in recent days by the government, which is that uh, uh, a few weeks ago, uh, there was this uh, second round of um, what we call Mexico talks. Uh, you know, these negotiations with the opposition that are being held in Mexico in recent months and in that second round, uh, uh, the Venezuelan government and the opposition, which uh, actually is uh, the White House, they agreed to sign uh, uh, a memorandum uh, where uh, the U.S. will release uh, something like about $3 billion uh, uh, to the Venezuelan government in order to respond to important issues related to uh, housing uh, and healthcare and emergency response to climate crisis. Uh, by the end of in October last year, we had a lot of problems with uh, the rainy season and landslide and floodings. And, 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 and I mean, that, uh, that decision, uh, that agreement, uh, the Venezuelan government has been saying lately that it has not been uh, fulfilled by the gringos. In Venezuela, in Venezuelan authorities, especially Jorge Rodriguez, has been talking about that in recent weeks. So it's important to, you know, uh, frame uh, your question, uh, frame that issue uh, within your question. And of course, I mean, I hope that that money comes to Venezuela. It's not going to be an easy tax task because... The U.S. is basically trying to bankrupt um, Citgo, which is not a, like a regular company. Citgo is one of the biggest, you know, you know that retailers of, of of gasoline in the U.S. and it owns like three refineries in the U.S. Very important refineries in the U.S. and uh, and uh, the. Uh, I mean, Citgo uh, value goes somewhere around the 15 or 20 billion dollars, but they has been trying in collusion with, uh, when I say they, I'm talking about the gringos, in collusion with the Venezuelan opposition to uh, let uh, some uh, arbitration uh, uh, decisions uh, get in the middle and, and and that's in my opinion a strategy just to uh put their hands at the end of the day on the whole Citgo corporation in the u.s and and that's why that's what made me believe that it's not gonna be an easy task but let's i mean they're, they're of course the venezuelan government is gonna push uh for uh uh, uh a reasonable solution to to this mess that has been created just because the gringo decided that Circo belonged to this crazy uh, you know interim government 
So let's see what happened with the gold. I I see also that there's a strategy of exhaustion. They are they are they are charging a lot of money for these uh, lawyer fir law firms that are helping uh, the opposition in Venezuela to you know to represent the interests of of the, of the fake government of Guaido. Uh, against the demands of the Venezuelan state and the Central Bank of Venezuela that has been legally uh, uh, working in order to regain uh, uh, that money uh, that is, I mean, the real value of that of that gold in, in the Bank of England goes very close to $2 billion. So, so I mean, uh, but there are fines, there are legal fees that... Uh, you know, has been mountain, and I believe also that there the idea is like to make uh, the more money they can out of the, you know, uh, exploitation of the resources that belong to uh, all Venezuelans. So, so I, I'm not very optimistic about that. Of course, I wish that 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 money and those resources come back to the Venezuelan people, uh, and we need it a lot, especially because. Uh, uh, economic conditions in Venezuela, but we can talk about later. I'm sure you're going to ask about that. Yeah, I would like to talk about the economic situation in a little bit, but Jesus, let's let's talk a little bit more about something that you mentioned, which is the negotiations that have been going on in Mexico between the Venezuelan government, the constitutional president, Nicolás Maduro, and the right-wing opposition. And one of the conditions is that the U.S. constantly demands that they, they say, new elections because the U.S. refuses to recognize the past elections in which the Chavistas have won the majority, although they haven't won all of them. For instance, the 2015 National Assembly election that was won by the right-wing opposition. Basically, the U.S. position is keep having new elections until the right-wing wins, and then we'll recognize those elections. But if the left wins, we, we will not recognize your victory, which is exactly what happened in 2021, when even the European Union was monitoring the regional elections in Venezuela and the, the EU. I mean, technically, I guess they recognize their results, whereas the U.S. refused to recognize those results. And in that in those elections in 2021, the Chavistas won the majority of the, the states in Venezuela. And Juan Guaido's party was completely devastated. They they won almost nothing in, in those regional elections. But anyway, uh, the opposition now, there's a huge pressure campaign to force the right wing opposition in Venezuela to unite behind one candidate to try to defeat Maduro and the United Socialist Party of Venezuela. So what do you think of this campaign to unite the opposition? How is it going? <laughs> uh, I mean, first of all, it's absolutely true what you say about the free and fair elections that's just like a like a euphemism for for uh, the elections uh, uh, where the opposition wins and, and chavismo is not there i mean that's what the gringos actually mean when they talk about free and fair elections an election where chavismo is not there and that's going to be very complicated because venezuela uh, is uh, very deep core chavista Disregarding all the conflicts and all the you know struggles that we have been facing in recent years, uh, Venezuela remains pretty uh, chavista. So, so that's I mean and that's important to highlight. And now jumping to the part of what's going to happen with the opposition and their unity, that is something that they use a lot in their names and. The, uh, but but it's just that it's like a like like a, a naming scene, but in reality the opposition in Venezuela is extremely divided. It's like uh, uh, it's not coherent. I mean that's basically uh, I mean in, in in a good part also part of the uh, electoral. I mean. Uh, behind the electoral victories of Chavismo, of course, there's a lot of popular support to Chavismo, but in recent years, uh, an important factor for the victories of Chavismo, of Maduro, is uh, uh, that division in the opposition. So they are talking right now about the, these uh, primaries uh, that they are planning to have by, uh, I believe, that by the end of this year. 
at some point, uh, uh, because we're going to have a, a presidential election, or a maybe early 2023, because we are supposed to have a presidential elections by the end of uh, 2023. So, so the time is already closing uh, too much uh, against you know the 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 desire of many right wingers, anti chavistas in Venezuela, uh, in order to get united. But the reality shows that uh, that unity is going to be very hard to achieve, especially after what happened uh, with this uh, uh, coup d'état against against uh, Guaido. I mean, disregarding this being uh, like uh, following directions from the Washington or the White House, I mean, uh, this create tensions with, uh, within the opposition because it's very clear if you follow Juan Guaido uh, timeline in Twitter, uh, you will see that it's very clear that he he did not agree with the decision, so so that creates tension, additional tensions to the ones that are already were already there, uh, in that path towards unity. So, uh, I I don't see a beautiful path for the unity of the opposition towards the presidential elections in 2023. And of course, the Venezuelan government and Chavismo will work for that, you know, those divisions to deepen because that's also part of the, you know, political uh, game in order to achieve victory. Especially taking into consideration that, that, that we still have, you know, issues and especially in the economic field. I mean, we, we talk a lot about, uh, you know, economic recovery in Venezuela, and that's a reality, but we still have too many issues, and President, President Maduro has been talking about that lately. Well, this is a good segue. I wanted to ask you about the economic situation. A few years ago, Venezuela was suffering with hyperinflation. There would sometimes be, you know, double-digit inflation in one day. It was very difficult. And now the situation is easier. There still is inflation, but there's inflation in many countries because there's a global inflation crisis. And now we see in Venezuela that it actually has lower interest than Argentina, a country where the inflation is largely because of IMF debt, uh, US dollar denominated debt, this kind of economic war also being waged, although not nearly as brutal as the economic war on Venezuela. And We've also seen reports, including from the Swiss bank Credit Suisse, estimating double digit GDP growth of the Venezuelan economy. So how do you see the Venezuelan economic situation, at least compared to a few few years ago? You said that it certainly there are a lot of problems, but I mean, the last time I was there was in 2019 and there were a lot of difficulties and it seems like some of those have certainly gotten better. Absolutely. I mean, compared with uh, 2019, uh, the economic condition in Venezuela is way, way better. Uh, but that doesn't mean that the problem has been solved. I mean, uh, a good friend of us, one of our the co-editors of Arinoco Tribune, Steve Lala, which is a Canadian, uh, he, he talked about that in a in a video, in an interview that we had a few months ago, and he basically, and what he said basically is that, I mean, from 2013 until 2019 or 20, uh, the Venezuelan GDP decreased by almost 75 percent. That means that if in 2013 we produce 100 billion, trillion dollars, whatever, uh, in 2020 we were only producing. Uh, uh, creating value in Venezuela, yes, uh, of uh, uh, of 25. So, uh, I mean, because of the reduction yeah. of 75 in the GDP. Also, the United Nations top expert on sanctions reported that the Venezuelan government lost 99% of its revenue because of U.S. sanctions. Absolutely. That happened uh, uh, the year after the, the sanctions began in 2020. Yes, and and recently uh, the the I mean a few days ago, President Maduro talked 
about uh, uh, Venezuelan economy being recovered, but uh, actually it was not Maduro. It was Freddy Bernal in an interview that happened two days ago. He mentioned that the revenues of Venezuela improve, but they only represent 10% of what uh, we had before the U.S. aggression. So that gives you an idea also on how bad the, I mean, how bad the Venezuelan economy is. And that is part, uh, I mean, and that was explained and, and this debate about the real economic situation of Venezuela, if you compare it with previous years, uh, uh, that explained why, for example, the Venezuelan government has been a little bit reluctant to make a... Uh, 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 improvement in the salaries of many Venezuelans, which is something that it has been debated in Venezuela a lot in recent weeks. Actually, a few days ago, uh, there, there was this protest uh, by teachers in Venezuela that were claiming for an improvement in salaries because, uh, uh, especially in the last quarter of this year, the devaluation of the Bolivar was uh, uh, going bad again. So the, the salaries of the Venezuelan workers expressed in dollars that uh, at the beginning of the year was somewhere around $30 monthly uh, uh, went down to, I believe that it's cor it currently is somewhere around $8 or $7. So, so the, the, the economic situation of Venezuela is still uh, not good enough to, to, uh, to, make uh, crazy announcements about salary increases and things like that. And you have to add, uh, you know, to that uh, picture, you have to also take into consideration that the government needs to improve uh, the, uh, the, the, the big uh, deficiencies that we have in electricity, in, uh, uh, in internet service, in... Uh, in many things that, that the government usually uh, invested a lot of these resources that, uh, that it has. And because we don't have those resources right now, uh, those uh, services uh, has been deteriorating uh, sharply in recent years. And, and, and we don't have enough money because especially when you talk about telecommunications, when you talk about electricity, when you talk about uh, 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 what is the other thing? Water service. I mean, those are services that requires a lot of investments. So, so, and from the other side, you have the the necessities of improving the production of oil, which also requires a lot of investments and and financial resources that the government does not have because they are, we are blocked, but also because. Uh, I mean, most of our resources are blocked, but also because uh, there, we don't have access to, like many countries, to financial, you know, to international loans. So, so it's not a, it's, it's not an easy, it's not an easy task to, to, I mean, it's complicated to explain that to some friends that, uh, that get happy when we talk about economic improvement and, and we have been improved a lot in recent years, in recent months, especially since 2018 when President Maduro announced the most recent economic uh, decisions. Uh, but uh, that improvement still needs a lot of, a lot of, you know, work, a lot of, uh, uh, and that's why the government uh, try to reach this agreement with the U.S. I know that a lot of friends of us in the left do not like uh, Venezuelan signing uh, contracts with Chevron, for example. But, but that's uh, I mean that's a necessity. I mean Venezuela need resources like many countries, and 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 we never have you know uh, rejected any uh, business opportunities. Uh, with any countries in our history. And we, especially in this current environment, we don't need to do that. So, uh, because we need those resources. So that's basically the economic economic situation in the country. Uh, that situation is creating, as I mentioned, this tension uh, uh, in relation to the salaries. And that tension might be uh, 
uh, taking, uh, I mean, the opposition might take advantage of that. And, and the government has been trying to explain in recent days why uh, there has not been decisions in recent months about, you know, trying to readjust the salaries of many Venezuelans. But of course, one also has to say when we talk about salaries, because the opposition exploit that a lot, that many Venezuelans, even the ones that, that are, you know, workers for the government, which are the most affected ones, because uh, their salaries are the ones that, that decree by the government, uh, they, most of the people and media outlets do not talk about uh, private workers receiving better wages than, than the public uh, sector ones. That's something that is a reality, um, but no one talks about that, and uh, and and no one's also uh, neither talk about the the fact that many Venezuelans, even even those working for the public sector, uh, besides receiving their salaries, they uh, in the middle of the crisis, many decided to to do something, you know, to do some gigs, as you call it in in, in the U.S., in order to make some money, and more most of those gigs they charge them in dollars. So, I mean, they have additional sources of income, not all of them, of course, but many Venezuelans have learned to, to deal with the crisis and they have been making money also in dollars. So it's kind of tricky, the whole uh, situation with, uh, with the salary deterioration, but of course one who have to recognize that uh, there are many Venezuelans, millions of Venezuelans, that is, are still very affected by the deterioration of, you know, the salary, at least the salary they receive from the from the from the government, the ones that work for the public sector. So, so that's part of the discussion in Venezuela in terms of uh, you know economic issues. But I'm pretty sure. Taking into consideration what I mentioned you, this interview that Freddy Bernal, which is the governor of, uh, of Táchira and, and a very important PSUV uh, politician uh, said uh, a few days ago, which is that the government is actually at this moment evaluating and analyzing the numbers, the figures in order to make an announcement recent, I mean, soon uh, about like an improvement in the salaries for many Venezuelans. And uh, I, I hope that that will happen. But again, the the, the 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 economic situation has improved a lot, but we still have a, a long way to go in terms of uh, in terms of uh, uh, having the same uh, financial resources and financial flexibility to uh, launch uh, big and necessary. Uh, infrastructure projects in the country and and, 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 and and projects in general in order to promote and facilitate the development of the country. Yeah, I mean, uh, Jesus, the economic suffering unleashed largely because of the sanctions and blockade, I mean, it really is devastating. Um, this is obviously a country where over 90% of Venezuela's exports were oil-related products, and because of the U.S. sanctions and blockade, it wasn't able to export and the government lost 99 percent of revenue so it's just it's been devastating but something that's been quite in, in impressive is that despite this in december at the end of 2022 the venezuelan government uh, launched the 4.4 million uh, launched the a record of 4.4 million housing units that have been created built by the government since chavez came to power in 1999 so maybe you can talk a little bit about this project, which is not that well known outside of Venezuela. And it's, of course, a reason why Chavismo still does have a base of support, because 4.4 million housing units have been created for poor and working Venezuelans. That's true. That's true. I mean, uh, those houses has been built uh, within a program that we call Gran Misión Vivienda Venezuela. That program was created like uh, around 2000, uh, if I remember well, 2010 or 2011. Uh, so the program has been there for almost uh, a little bit more than 10 years. And, and 
four million houses has been built especially for the most vulnerable Venezuelan families. And that's absolutely amazing. And President Maduro, when he was in this ceremony delivering the house 4.4 million a few weeks ago, uh, he said that for this year, for 2023, the plan is to at least uh, uh, build 500,000 more houses. So by the end of the year, we might be very close to 5 million houses built in Venezuela by the Chavista government within the framework of Gran Misión Vivienda Venezuela, which you could translate like the great uh, Venezuelan housing program or mission. So, so, so yes, I mean, uh, Chavismo has been doing a lot of things uh, 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 in order to give uh, power to Venezuelans. But many of those programs has been heavily affected by the sanctions, by the lack of resources that I, I was mentioning and you were mentioning. And, 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 uh, and for example, that's, I mean, uh, the, I believe that the housing uh, program is part of these agreements in the, in the Mexico talks that that, that we signed and where basically the gringos uh, allowed uh, to release uh, $3 billion uh, uh, to Venezuela. So, so I mean, it's, it's something, I mean, the connection between the, the difficulties of the Venezuelan government to, to, to do the things that the government usually did uh, and connecting that to the to the sanctions and the blockade against Venezuela just yes, because they want to get rid of President Maduro is something that uh, that that needs to be highlighted and connected. And 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 we had other you know social programs different than that Gran Misión Vivienda Venezuela. I mean, I mean anyone in Venezuela. Uh, uh, recognize that that this housing program has been building uh, an incredible amount of houses all over the country uh, and uh, but we also have uh, mission barrio adentro which uh, which is an important healthcare program that was initiated by hugo chavez that brought uh, health care for many venezuelans that that didn't have access to real uh, quality healthcare, and we did that with the help of the Cubans at the beginning, and, and we still are, you know, working with them with these programs. But those programs has been heavily affected also by the lack of resources, uh, but they are still there, and a lot of Venezuelans uh, uh, receive uh, uh, healthcare uh, services uh, through uh, Mission Barrio Adentro. But also we did Mission Robinson that that get uh, help Venezuela get rid of illiteracy, and that happened also because of the help of the of the of the Cuban people, and, and 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 not only and that was a very comprehensive program because that program also uh, helped ma millions of Venezuelans not only to to get rid of illiteracy, but the they put them into a fast track program in order to help them finish elementary school. And then they, they could jump, those that wanted to do it, they could jump to high school. And then they also uh, have uh, facilities in order to reach higher education. I'm talking about college education. I'm talking about associate degrees. So, so I mean, the 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 commitment of Chavismo, of the Bolivarian Revolution towards uh, uh, the Venezuelan people is undeniable. And no one can, uh, disregarding all the smearing campaigns against Chavismo, against Venezuela, against socialism and communism, no one can deny the, 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 the achievement that we have reached in recent uh, years, uh, at least in the last uh, two decades uh, that Venezuela has been uh, under the Chavista leadership. So, but of course we are affected heavily by, especially since 2018, 2019, by the blockade of the gringos and the sanctions and all those illegal actions that 
has uh, uh, somehow, I mean, according to some experts, more than 100,000 Venezuelans have died as a direct consequence of those of, of those uh, war measures, because uh, many uh, UN experts, uh, UN reporters, has been saying that these are acts of war, and that's what they really are. Actually, it's a soft war against Venezuela in order, yes, because they don't like the Chavist government. Yeah, the estimate of 100,000 Venezuelans who have died because of U.S. sanctions. It comes from the former top UN top expert, Alfred Desayas, who, who reported that. Um, Jesus, there's, there's so much we could talk about in terms of Venezuela, but I want to pivot to its foreign policy and the changing diplomatic situation. Just a few years ago, at the peak of the US-led coup attempt in 2019 with Juan Guaido, many countries in Latin America did have right-wing governments. And they joined the United States in this coup attempt against Venezuela's Chavista government. I should mention, though, I should emphasize that even at the peak of the U.S.-led coup attempt in 2019, only less than one third of the countries on Earth recognized Guaido. Still, always, a majority of the countries on Earth recognized Maduro and the real Venezuelan government, including China, Russia, India, even Turkey, a, a NATO member, you know, formerly known as Turkey. So um, most of Africa, the only African nation that recognized Guaido was Morocco. Um, so m most of the global South, most of the global population always recognized Maduro. But now at this point, I mean, no one, rec I mean, clearly even the U.S. doesn't recognize Guaido anymore. He's, he's gone. But the U.S. is one of less than 10 countries that refuses to recognize Maduro. And in the region in Latin America, the situation has changed very drastically, especially now with the change in government in Colombia. For the first time ever, Colombia has a left-wing president, Gustavo Petro. And although during his presidential campaign, he had criticized Venezuela, his policy has been very diplomatic. He's taken two trips already to Venezuela and met with President Maduro. He just took a trip um, just you know, today is January 12th. He just took a trip a few days ago. So um, can you talk about how Venezuela's diplomatic outlook has changed? You know, a few years ago, there was this thing called the Lima Group, which was part of the OAS. It was created by the U.S. to try to basically launch a coup in Venezuela. That was the whole point of the Lima Group. And then Pedro Castillo came in in Peru and he was since overthrown. But when he came in, it was the end of the Lima Group. Um, now Lula da Silva is in in Brazil, and he immediately restored relations with Venezuela when he entered office on January 1st, because the former far-right president, Bolsonaro, had recognized Guaido. How, has, how, has, how have you in Venezuela, how have the people there uh, experienced these diplomatic changes? Yes, the... I mean, these uh, changes in the political landscape in, in the region, uh, many Chavistas, many Venezuelans, even even the non-Chavista one, especially the, 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 the one in, in Colombia, uh, we see it uh, uh, with optimism. I mean, many Venezuelans are happy because of the reapproachment uh, uh, between Venezuela and Colombia. We are sister countries, I mean, uh, uh, the relations between Colombia and Venezuela are very interlinked in too many ways, uh, and not only economic, I mean, uh, culturally, historically, and, uh, and, and we are, by many accounts, we are destined to be together. So, so the, the, the fact that Ivan Duque, uh, as well as Bolsonaro in Brazil, uh, Ivan Duque, the former president of Colombia, uh, took the decision of follow the direction of Washington in this regime change operation and launch against President Maduro, uh, 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 shows uh, how disconnected these right-wing elites are from the reality and from their own people. I mean. 
they affected uh, the, the, our relationship with Venezuela, they damaged our relationship with, with Venezuela that was very favorable for the people in their own countries. So this is what is happening at least, <coughs> sorry, at least in recent uh, months with President Petro in, in uh, uh, and Venezuela. I mean, uh, the, the, the new Colombian government has made a lot of uh, positive decisions in order to redefine and reshape and reconnect uh, 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 with Venezuela. And the Venezuelan government, of course, has reciprocated because, I mean, that's the nature of the of the Venezuelan people and the nature of the of the Chavista approach towards towards not only towards Colombia but towards Latin America. I mean, being a Chavista means being a, a, a believer in the concept of patria grande, and that means uh, really believing and feeling that from Mexico to Argentina we are the same people, the same nation. So, so this reconnection uh, uh, with Colombia uh, can only be applauded by any Chavista, and the Chavista government, led by Maduro, uh, has been showing that commitment to reunite, and 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 that uh, represents a lot of positive ish. I mean, uh, positive uh, outcomes uh, for Venezuela. I mean, in I mean, a few days ago. About in on on January first, uh, the uh, the border bridges between Colombia and Venezuela were open or reopen, and 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 now there's not only a transit of you know cargo transit uh, between the countries, but there is also transit of uh, private vehicles between the two countries and. and and, and transit of uh, transport company, you know, I mean, passenger uh, transport companies between the two countries. Those things did not happen for the last, I don't know, like five or six years. We did not have uh, any of that communication. The only thing that happened between Venezuela and Colombia was the transit be, uh, of persons in the border through uh, illegal trails, something that we call trochas, and that is controlled by, uh, by, 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 by paramilitary forces in Colombia mostly, and criminal gangs uh, in Colombia or Venezuela. So, so right now with this new uh, uh, connection between the two countries, I mean, things are improving a lot, and the economic uh, and trade are Later also gets better, and that benefits both countries because the north uh, uh, east of Colombia was heavily affected by the policies of the Banduque against uh, Chavismo. So, so I mean, we are very happy. Uh, of course, there are a lot of uh, threats that comes with this uh, reapprochement between Colombia and Venezuela. But uh, and those threats are mostly connected with you know the security. Uh, threats uh, no one for no one is uh, i mean no one uh, can deny that uh, that colombia is a country with uh, paramilitary groups with uh, with mercenaries and and, and 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 the possibility of that kind of people getting into venezuela just to following uh, washington and white house directions is always there in criminal gangs and and that kind of you know security issues that uh, that um, are going to to rise because uh, right now the communications and the exchanges between the, the our two peoples are, uh, is increasing. But uh, that we have to take that risk. I mean, I, I mean, I believe that uh, that that we need to do that because uh, the positive outcomes are bigger than the negative ones. Another important threat that comes out of the reopening of commercial and trade relations between the two countries is the one connected to the exchange rate in the border. Uh, 
and and that's something that was addressed a few days ago also by, by Freddy Bernal, which is the governor of Táchira State, which is one of the most important border countries between uh, border states between uh, between Colombia and Venezuela, where San Cristóbal is the capital and, and, and San Antonio uh, is the border city that connects with Cúcuta. So, uh, uh, and but especially with between 2015 and 2019 or 20, there was this resolution number eight uh, approved by Colombian authorities that allowed uh, an special exchange rate between the Colombian peso and the Bolivar in Cúcuta. So the exchange rate between the Bolivar and the Venezuelan Bolivar uh, was uh, in, in Bogota something, and in Cúcuta was different. And that created this distortion that many Venezuelans and a lot of economists, experts in Venezuela, uh, uh, relate to the crazy devaluation of the, of the Bolivar during those years. So the threat of that being happening again uh, is there. But, uh, the situation in Venezuela right now is different than, than, than between 2015 and 2019, because especially because the Venezuelan government has taken the practical decision of allowing the, 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 the dollar to be used in many transactions in the, in the country and in border places, border states like Táchira, and that this was said in this interview by Freddy Bernal, uh, 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 many transactions, uh, actually Freddy Bernal talked about 70% of the transactions, financial transactions in Táchira State are made in Colombian pesos. And he said that just to, uh, to, to make a point on the impact that the exchange rate will have on the Bolivar. I mean, and he also mentioned that, and, and that's a reality in 2000, like two years ago or one year and a half ago, uh, yeah, the Venezuelan government allowed for citizens in Táchira State to have bank accounts, Venezuelan bank accounts uh, denominated in Colombian pesos. And that's a strategy in order to reduce the, the pressure on the dollar and the Bolivar and the peso in border areas. And I believe that will have a positive impact in, I mean, in reducing the threats of having the exchange rate uh, affecting the Bolivar in the coming months. So I'm optimistic about that, but of course the threat is still there. And with Brazil, we are happy. Uh, yesterday, actually, I was reading a news about uh, Combiasa. Uh, I, I haven't confirmed it. Uh, uh, yet, but I was reading that Conviasa uh, reached an agreement uh, in, uh, with Brazilian authorities to resume uh, flights uh, to Manaus, which is one of the most, the most important city in the north of, of Brazil. So, so that will be uh, a great news if it is confirmed. And I'm sure that after uh, reopening, you know, uh, flight, commercial uh, flight operations with Manaus, uh, Sao Paulo and Rio will come soon. So so uh, with Lula, we are pretty sure that that that, that we, the relations with Brazil will resume. Actually, a few weeks ago, uh, there was this uh, ceremony in Brasilia uh, where uh, the defenders of the Venezuelan embassy in Brasilia uh, gave back to Jorge Rodriguez, which was in Brazil for the inauguration of Lula, I'm talking about January the 1st, uh, gave the Venezuelan embassy back to, to the Venezuelan government in a you know, symbolic ceremony that happened. And that's, that was very inspiring because uh, they tried to do uh, in Brasilia what they did in Washington. I mean, right-wingers try to occupy our diplomatic missions in, in, in Brasilia as they uh, did in Washington, D.C. in 2019 when this 
crazy regime change operation began with Juan Guaido. And, but the Brazilian social movements uh, managed to, to defend the, the Venezuelan embassy in Brasilia, and they, has, they were there since 2019 with Venezuelan diplomats, of course, that were basically kind of kidnapped within uh, that, uh, that uh, you know, diplomatic headquarter. Uh, they were there defending the, the embassy. So, so the, the, the outcome is positive. I mean, the, the, the regional Latin American environment is very positive. We have progressive government of different colors. One, one might not be as good as others, but, but I'm pretty optimistic. I, uh, Alula announced a few hours after, the, after he, his inauguration that he was going back to CELAC and, and, and now we're going to have this select uh, summit uh, uh, that you mentioned in, in Argentina soon. So, so I believe that that, that, that we're going to see a reinforcement of you know regional uh, integration, unity, bodies that has been. The, the, uh, when, when the region was controlled by right-wing governments. Uh, they try to get rid of those bodies, but those bodies are extremely necessary. I mean, I remember now that I, we see these days these crazy uh, uh, developments in Peru, uh, one cannot forget uh, how important it was to have UNASUR. I mean, when Hugo Chavez was in power and, and we had UNASUR and, and, and then we had CELAC, Whenever we had this crazy, uh, you know, a regional crisis like the one we are seeing right now in Peru, uh, there was this call for an emergency summit of pressing from UNASUR or, or from CELAC. And, 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 and within those bodies, uh, uh, a discussion about how to solve this crisis uh, happened. And we don't have that right now. And the only thing that we have right now is the OIS that everyone knows that is controlled by Washington and that have lost a lot of credibility, not only among uh, leftist government, but also uh, among the general population in the, in the, in the, in the region. So, so, I mean, uh, we hope that CELAC will revive uh, in this summit in Argentina, and, and, and we hope that we will go back to the times when we decided by ourselves how to solve the political crisis in the region. So, so, so that's my take about this, you know, regional situation. I'm glad you mentioned Peru. This is a very good segue because in Peru, you mentioned there's been this coup and the coup regime on January 9th massacred 17 protesters. At least 47 protesters have been killed in just one month. And one of the main demands of the protesters is a constituent assembly to create a new constitution. The other two main demands are new elections and the release of President Pedro Castillo, who was imprisoned for 18 months without trial. But the Constituent Assembly demand for a new constitution is relevant because Hugo Chavez, when he ran for president in 1998, immediately after coming in in 1999, there was a, an, a Constituent Assembly in Venezuela to create a new constitution. There was also another Constituent Assembly in Venezuela in 2017. Maybe you can talk about that. But this, is, this could be a potential model for other countries in the region, like in Peru, where there is right now this large popular movement demanding a constituent assembly, or even in Chile, um, both Peru and Chile are still using the constitutions that were written by the U.S.-backed dictatorships. In the case of Chile, they're still using the constitution written by Pinochet, the fascist dictator installed through a CIA coup. And in Peru, they're still using the constitution written by the fascist dictator Alberto Fujimori after he d destroyed uh, all democratic institutions and dissolved Congress. So 
Uh, can you talk about the democratic process of having a constituent assembly in Venezuela and what lessons people can learn from it? Yes, that's an important question, and, and uh, especially for us, because, I mean, just a few days after the crisis in Peru began, we published in, in Orinoco TV in a piece by Clodovaldo Hernández, a Venezuelan writer journalist, where he talked about what happened in, uh, in these many Latin American countries that get, got defeated uh, by right-wing coups and why did not why that didn't happen in Venezuela I mean that was basically the the, the, the scope of the of the of the opinion piece that he wrote and one of the scenes he 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 he, he numbers several things that he consider are part of the reasons that that you know right-wing attempts, that we have experienced also, I have not been able to damage us the way uh, they have damaged, uh, I mean, Honduras or Peru or, or, or Ecuador or, or many other countries in the region, Bolivia. So, uh, so one of the things that he mentioned uh, uh, was uh, the Constituent Assembly. And I really believe that the Constituent Assembly uh, is a, a, a tool that was uh, given to us by Hugo Chavez uh, in order to face, uh, you know, uh, institutional crisis like the one uh, uh, that right now is being faced by, by Peru. Uh, and actually, as you mentioned, as the one that we faced in 2017, in 2000, uh, when, when they were trying to ask President Maduro and, 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 and Maduro decided to call a constituent assembly that helped uh, Chavismo to right the coup attempts that were launched by the uh, Congress controlled by the opposition at that time. So, but, but going back to Peru, I mean, and to this discussion about constituent assemblies, uh, uh, because we published that, that piece from Clodovaldo Hernández, uh, we received a few feedbacks on Twitter, and, 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 and there was this so-called uh, 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 leftist in, 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 in Peru, that he called himself sympathetic with Chavismo, that say that, 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 that it's not reasonable to compare the constituent process of, of Venezuela with the lack of decisions of Pedro Castillo and not moving on with his, uh, in his attempt to, because a constituent assembly and a new constitution was one of the main promises of Pedro Castillo during his presidential campaign. So he was trying to excuse uh, somehow Pedro Castillo for not being able to launch a constituent process. And, and he said that, that President Chavez had the military on his side and that's why it was very easy to, to to reach a constituent process in Venezuela, which was not, which is not accurate. I mean, President Chavez comes from the military, came from the military, but uh, but he didn't have the, the support of the military in 1999 when he took office. I mean, he actually had the opposite, uh, uh, and 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 he neither have the support of the majority of the status quo of Venezuela when uh, the constituent process in Venezuela began in 1999, uh, and he did a lot of uh, intrepid uh, moves in order to move the country towards what he promised. And that's why one of the things that, since the very beginning, uh, struck me about Hugo Chavez when he first appeared in, in the Venezuelan political scene, that he was committed to whatever he promised, to whatever he said he was going to do. And, and it was amazing how in 1999, uh, uh, Hugo Chavez moved the country, even get support from 
liberals and people and even right wingers that help him move on with the project of constituent assembly. It's important to highlight that the Venezuelan constitution at that time was written in 1969 and was like encapsulating itself. I mean, it was a constitution that did not allow referenda, that did not allow popular consultation, that did not allow a uh, constituent assembly. So the constitution didn't give the legal framework to move towards a constituent process. But Chavez managed his policy and his political action in a such amazing way that he pushed the, the Supreme Court of Venezuela in order to recognize that uh, the most important value of democracy is the people. And, 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 and with that concept, he pushed the Supreme Court in order to recognize that uh, a referendum could be done in order to ask Venezuelans if we wanted to have a constituent process in a new constitution. And that's what finally happened by the end of 1999. It was a complex process is what I wanted to highlight the most. Actually, we have been seeking in Orinoco Tribune to do a special activity about that because we believe that it is, it, it is very important, especially in countries around the world, in countries in Latin America, to understand what really happens in Venezuela, because I believe that some people think that this is a piece of cake and this is, I mean, it's not an, an easy task, but it's not impossible neither. And I believe that explaining what happened in Venezuela might refresh the memory for some people. And, 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 and some people that might be listening to us right now might be thinking that what I say about Chavez not being, not having military support is, is not a true. It's, but it's a reality. I mean, Chavez did not have a, a military support at the beginning. I mean, of course, with the years after several coup attempts, the one in 2002, the one in 2003, in several other military attempts, the, 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 the military in Venezuela began to get depurated, you know, uh, from, you know, the right wing, uh, uh, you know, forces inside the military. And that doesn't mean that it's completely depurated. We have a lot of uh, right wing uh, military officers still, you know, in the military, but, but it's nothing in comparison with what we had in 1999. Uh, uh, and of course, when Chavez died, uh, he had, of course, a lot of support from the military, but that was not the, the reality in 1999. So I just wanted to highlight that because the constituent process is something that I believe that, I mean, they, I mean Rafael Correa in Ecuador uh, somehow uh, managed to move towards that uh, when he was in office. And, and, and that's a, a great achievement that Ecuadorians reach uh, during the, the, the times of President Correa. And also that happened with Evo Morales, that he managed to have a new uh, constitution with a constituent process when he was in power. So, uh, but many countries in the region, and I know that even in other parts of the world, uh, uh, are inspired by the Bolivarian, the Chavista constituent process. And I believe that we need to learn and to talk a little bit more about it, especially because this, you know, situation uh, and discussions, the way that happened uh, under the, you know, within the, the framework of the, of the events in Peru. So that's why I, I believe that your question is pretty uh, relevant because we need to push to inform and to let people know better about how, you know, we can use those constitutional tools in order to, to make political change a reality and to bulletproof uh, imperial aggressions, you know, against uh, progressive socialists, uh, projects not only in the region but around the world so so i believe that that discussion is important so that's why we are planning to do something about that soon to try to you know uh, help people 
and see the, this thing in, in a better way. Well, I think that's a really good note to start wrapping up. Um, can you, uh, Jesus, can you tell people where they can find more of your work? Of course, you, people can go to orinocotribune.com, um, but how, how can they support your work? Yes, of course. The, the, I mean, the financial support is important. We struggle a lot with that. Uh, uh, Orinoco Tribune uh, is, has been already there for four years, and we have achieved amazing things that we uh, that we didn't know that we could achieve uh, and we have been trying to initially we were created and we still do that uh, you know trying to fill the gap the the translation gap between uh, between uh, Spanish language and English language which I I believe is an important barrier for people outside the region to to understand what really happens in Venezuela and in Latin America. But then we decided to go beyond Latin America and we touch also important anti-imperialist issues from around the world. And we have also been trying to create our own content in recent in recent in recent months, and we have improved a, a lot in in that direction. So, so, so I invite people to visit us. We are at orinocotribune.com. Uh, and, and if you find us in most social media platforms, you can find us also on the Orinoco Tribune. And, uh, and I invite you to support our work. You can donate uh, through Patreon, uh, through, we have a tax deductible, agreement with the alliance for global justice so if you are in the u.s you can have your tax uh you know you have your donation being tax deductible uh if you uh make a donation through that gateway that we open with the alliance for global justice you can donate with paypal but we need your support of course like many of us uh, including you uh, uh ben uh uh, I mean, many of us independent media out there uh, need financial support to make things happen because we cannot, I mean, we cannot lead out, uh, out of air, <laughs> you know, we, and we need to, to resource more resources to, you know, to improve. I mean, if, if we uh, could have like more resources, uh, we could be able to pay uh, a, a good Venezuelan journalist to do more uh, reportage in the, on the ground here in Venezuela or travel to regions and, and do direct, you know, interviews and things like that. So, I mean, uh, resources are, are always important. So we invite people to support us and to visit us and to know the work that we do visit in orinojotribune.com. Thank you for the question. Definitely, yeah. I... I echo that, and I would recommend people going to orinocotribune.com, checking out their reporting, and considering to support them because their work is very important. Um, Jesus, it's always a pleasure. Thanks for joining me. Um, I hope to have you back sometime soon. Me too. Me too. We need to do something, compa.